We will start the forum now. I would like to introduce Mr. Ken Shibusawa, President and CEO of the Japan Center for International Exchange. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests. Uh, and on behalf of the Government of Japan and the World Bank, I would like to welcome everybody to the Global Conference on Universal Health Coverage for Inclusive and Sustainable Health. Uh, my name is Ken Shibusawa, President and CEO of the Japan Center for International Exchange, JCIE, and we are one of the cooperating uh, organizations for this conference. At the beginning, um, as you know, we had some sad news overnight. Um, there was a passing of a great man that stood for the advancement of the human spirit, um, something that actually this conference is uh, all about. Um, so if you allow us, um, I'd like to have a moment of silence for Dr. Nelson Mandela. Thank you very much. Um, JCIE has had the pleasure of working with the World Bank and the government of Japan on this important research uh, on universal health coverage since uh, January of last year. The partnership grew out of Project JCIE organized several years ago with the Lancet to produce a Lancet Japan series that examined the evolution of the Jap Japanese health system that, and the strength and challenges that it faces today. Uh, many of the researchers who made the series successful are here today, and I, I want to thank them for their contribution. As countries around the world are recognizing the value of universal health coverage, this is a great opportunity for Japan to share its experience and learn from other countries, which is the goal of this project. I hope this will prove to be a successful exercise in mutual learning across countries and also across sectors. Um, Japan is lucky to have one of the world's top global health champions. Uh, many of you already know Professor Keizo Takemi, who is the member of the Upper House uh, of the Japanese Diet and also a senior fellow of JCIE. And I'm very happy to see him this morning. He had a very uh, busy schedule overnight with the Upper House. There's been lots of uh, action there. So uh, I would like to ask uh, doc, uh, Dr. Takemi for some opening remarks, please. Uh, good morning. Before I start to make my own opening remarks, I would like to express my deepest condolences to the people of the South Africa and all over the world who really respect Nelson Mandela. And now, uh, our the Vice Prime Minister Taro Aso and the President of the World Bank, Jim Young Kim, he has just arrived, and the distinguished the health ministers from the Ghana, Myanmar, Senegal, and Vietnam, and distinguished the guests and ladies and gentlemen. I am excited to see the momentum building around the world today toward the universal health coverage, with many countries at the various stages of achieving universal health coverage, we have an opportunity to share lessons and ideas with one another, which is the goal of this conference today. But I do realize the universal health coverage is still tool, it's not the goal. This is the tool to promote and protect the human life itself. Japan first achieved the universal health coverage in 1961, when we were still a developing country with a per capita GDP roughly equal to a Sri Lanka. More than 50 years later, we faced challenges in our health system, but we still enjoy some of the world's the best health indicators and longest life expectancy. Because Japan has been fortunate enough to enjoy the good health at low cost with equity, we feel that we have an obligation to help other countries 
achieved the good health as well. Our Prime Minister Shinzo Abe announced his speech at the UN General Assembly in September that his administration would put priority on global health in its aid policy. In fact, under his leadership, we adopted a first strategy on global health diplomacy this past May. And a major component of that strategy is promoting universal health coverage and helping partner countries achieve the UHC. Japan's emphasis on universal health coverage comes in part from having witnessed the first hand the advantages of UHC for our society. But it also comes from our commitment to human security, which Japan has been promoting as a cornerstone of our foreign policy since 1997. The human security places equal value on every single human life and utilize a dual approach of protection and empowerment to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to live up to their own potential. Health is at the core of human well-being and human security can be achieved with uh, cannot be achieved without the universal health coverage, which ensures that that every individual has access to necessary health care services without risk of financial devastation. I'm honored to be sharing the stage with my friends and fellow champions of universal health coverage today. And I see that we have an impressive lineup of representatives from around the world who have been successfully promoting universal health coverage in their own countries in the face of many challenges. I look forward to learning from all of you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Takemi. Um, at this point, I would like to invite Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General, World Health Organization, for her uh, welcoming remarks, please. Thank you very much, Chad. His Excellency, uh, Mr. Aso, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Japan, Professor Takimi, President Jim Kim, Excellencies, Distinguished Ministers, Representatives of Development Partners and Civil Society, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you to this high-level ministerial forum on universal health coverage. We are looking at universal health coverage as an instrument for sustainable and equitable economic growth. Mounting evidence tells us that investment in health, especially when they aim for universal access to quality services, contribute to poverty alleviation and share prosperity among nations. I thank the government of Japan and the World Bank for organizing this event. The Japan World Bank Partnership for Universal Coverage, Universal Health Coverage, has supported case studies of health reform in many countries, and emphasizing health financing, human resources for health, and the links between health and the wider economy. Yesterday, you heard about experiences in 10 of these countries, representing the wide diversity of settings. Today, we will focus on extracting lessons from these experiences. There is no universal model or pathway to universal health coverage, but experiences from one country can be highly instructive for others facing similar challenges with similar ambitions. Country experiences also yield an impressive range of policy options, reinforcing evidence and arguments set out in the 2010 World Health Report on health system financing. You will hear about the work and views of development partners and civil society, another vocal and articulate partner in supporting UHC. I thank civil society organizations for their recent and compelling call to action on universal health coverage. Japan is likely the best possible host for this event, and I want to thank you. Japan was an early achiever Japan has established an effective guarantee of universal service coverage 
as you have heard from Professor Takimi, with financial protection in 1961 and giving virtually everyone access to preventive, curative, and rehabilitative services at an affordable cost. That achievement was part of a deliberate effort to foster social cohesion and human security. In Japan, everyone is required by law to have health insurance, and fees are strictly regulated by the government to keep them affordable. UHC is not cheap, but it is affordable when the right policies are in place. Again, Japan provides an excellent example. Government per capita spending on health in Japan is lower than the average among all the OECD countries and about half of what the US spends. At a time when health costs are soaring in many countries, Japan's tight regulation of the health industry has kept costs in check. A recent study summarized Japan's health system very well, and let me quote, good health at low cost with equity. That is truly a commendable achievement. I also would like to take this opportunity to thank His Excellency Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for his Lancet commentary with its strong support for universal health coverage as a post-2015 strategy his articulation of the three global health challenges that can be met through UHC makes compelling good sense. And this is a kind of high level commitment and leadership that can you know, lead the world in the right direction. The World Bank, of course, you know, I'm so happy my very good friend Jim is here. The World Bank is an equally valued partner also for the Big Cho. And we are working hand in hand and shoulder to shoulder to extend technical and financial advice to the growing number of countries that have made universal health coverage the goal for health systems reform. We have jointly held consultations with ministers of health and ministers of finance, and we have jointly conducted training courses in countries. This partnership, close partnership between WHO and the World Bank, sends a very strong signal that UHC is financially feasible and makes good economic sense. Health officials, I, I was told, health officials are always encouraged to know that we are working together so well. And I suspect this collaboration gives, especially ministers of health, some weight in terms of their arguments when they approach their ministers of finance. So Jim, we need your help there. And we have very good reason to anticipate that UHC will have a firm place on the post-2015 development agenda. Today, you will hear a status report on what WHO and the World Bank are doing to establish a framework and indicators for measuring progress, progress towards universal health coverage. Monitoring progress towards UHC means monitoring social equity and share prosperity. In fact, UHC is the ultimate expression of fairness. People who cannot afford to pay for health care are not left behind, left behind to die or to stay sick. None of those options is attractive. Again, a very warm welcome to all of you. The outcome of this unique Japan World Bank partnership and the diversity of experiences within countries will help guide the way forward as we move towards the post-2015 development agenda. On that, a very warm welcome again, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chan. <clears throat> uh, now I'd like to ask Dr. Timothy Evans, Director of Health, Nutrition, Population at the World Bank, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, his Excellency, the Honorable Taro Aso, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, uh, other distinguished members of the dais and the diet, um, Honorable Ministers of Health, colleagues and comrades uh, for universal health coverage. On behalf of the Japan World Bank Partnership Program on universal health coverage, I'd like to extend you a warm welcome. Today's a very exciting event. Uh, yesterday, we enjoyed discussions on the technical 
uh, dimensions of the case studies supported through this program informed by comments uh, and uh, perspectives from a much broader group uh, that were assembled. Uh, today, we bring this into the arena of moving forward with policy uh, and implications of these studies. Uh, we've completed these studies over the last two years. Now the journey moving forward to continue uh, in the perpetual pursuit of universal health coverage continues. Let me extend my thanks at this point in time uh, to the government of Japan for all of their support through this study. Uh, we've had an excellent partnership and we look forward to much further collaboration moving forward. And I look forward to an excellent day. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Um, now I would like to ask uh, to, the, to, the, to the podium, Honorable Taro Aso, uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance of Japan, for his opening remarks. I'm Taro Aso. Before I make the speech, I also like to express my sincere condolence to the, the great man from South Africa who influenced so many people, and not only in Africa, but in all over the world. Well, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this global conference on universal health coverage, jointly organized by the World Bank and the government of Japan. I'm very pleased to see so many participants, and would like to thank you all your coming all the way from all over the world. In particular, I would like to recognize several of our distinguished guests, including Dr. Margaret Chan, the Director General of the World Health Organization, the Honorable Mrs. Sherry Ayati, I hope my pronunciation is correct, the Minister of Health of Ghana, the Honorable Dr. Pe Te Kim, the Union Minister of Health of Myanmar, the Honorable Professor Awa Mary Korosek, the Minister of Health and Social Action of the Republic of Senegal, and Honorable Dr. Gwen T. Kim Tien, the Minister of Health of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. I would like to also express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Jim, Kim, uh, Jim Yon Kim, the president of the World Bank and co-host of this conference. Healthcare is fundamentally important to ensuring the well-being and dignity of our citizens. It helps to cultivate the human resources needed for economic and social development, which together with the economic infrastructure lay the found <clears throat> foundation for poverty reduction and prosperity. The state of glo global health is changing significantly due to aging population and shift in disease structure from tuberculosis and other infectious diseases to non-communicable ones such as high blood pressure, diabetes, and cancer. To address these various health needs, country needs to enhance <coughs> <coughs> enhance the overall level of health care systems. That's why the university health coverage is increasingly important. I believe, thank you, I believe that Japan as a developed and responsible country has an obligation to promote the global cooperation on health. And I believe that our own experiences on universal health coverage will be informative and valuable 
for developing countries seeking to realize this goal. Over the past half a century, Japan has significantly improved its national level of health and achieved the longest life expectancy in the world. In 1950, Japan, Japanese men lived an average of only 60 years. I would be out. <laughs> and Japanese women lived an average of 63 years. By 2012, average life expectancy increased to 80 years from, for men and 86 years for women. This was not a, something that we accomplished easily. Right after World War II, the national income level was very, very low. But Japan actively invested in public health even before the economy started to grow. Following an, an enactment of the National Health Insurance Act in 1958. We achieved the universal health coverage in 1961 by making health care service available in Japan to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Since then, the system has evolved to improve its fairness while containing costs. For example, we instituted instituted various budgetary transfers and subsidies to reduce the disparities between socio-economic groups. We also introduced a common nationwide medical service fee system to control costs. Healthcare system contributed greatly to the expansion of the healthy and productive middle class, which propelled and supported the economic growth. Today, Japan faced the new challenges. Healthcare costs are growing. Due to rapidly aging populations, and the rising cost of medical technology. To improve the sustainability of healthcare system, Japan needs to rationalize and streamline medical services. We are currently considering several reform measures. For example, we recognize the need to maintain equity, not just between the younger and the older beneficiaries, beneficiaries, but also among those in the same age group with differing financial means. So, some of our reforms we are exploring include a revised co-payment scheme for the elderly in changing the method of the allocating medical costs from traditional age-based scheme to means-based ones. More specifically, we are considering enhanced fiscal transfers from insurers with wealthier contributors to those with poorer ones and restrictions on budgetary support to those better off insurers. Japan experiences demonstrate that any country at any level of development can improve the health of its citizens and that investment in universal health coverage yields huge return to society. Our experiences also show that even after creating the universal healthcare system, 
continuous reform will be necessary for assuring fairness, increasing the quality of medical services, and maintaining the fiscal sustainability. To share these and other lessons from our experiences, Japan and the World Bank conducted a two-year study called the Japan World Bank Partnership Program on Universal Health Coverage. As you know, the World Bank has been a leader in promoting the universal health coverage in developing countries, so it was a pleasure collaborating with them on this effort. Maybe he was a doctor. <laughs> Today's conference marks the official completion of the joint study and the that it will be it will jump start the rapid and widespread adoption of universal health coverage throughout the world. Japan and the World Bank are also organizing the flagship course of universal health coverage to help the developing countries learn about the strategies for achieving this goal. About 80 trainees from over 20 nations will participate, mainly health and fiscal policy officials of developing countries. I'm very pleased that we have come this far and expect that the flagship course will further promote the sharing of the result of the joint study. There is nothing more fundamental to human well-being than health, both for individual and for society as a whole. Investing in people, including their ability to live healthy and productive lives is absolutely critical to reducing poverty and achieving the economic growth. It is never too early to work towards universal health coverage, even for countries at an early stage of development. But once established, it is important to continuously enhance the universal health care system to ensure their sustainability, quality, and fairness. In closing, I would like to reiterate Japan's determination to actively share our experiences and expertise to assist the country in their development. And I want to understand and underscore more commitment to work with the international community to address common challenges including in the area of health. Thank you for your kind attention and participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Aso. Now I would like to invite to the podium Dr. Jim Young Kim, President of the World Bank, for his keynote speech, please. First, I would uh, like to um, excuse me a little bit. Up. I'd like to also express my uh, uh, condolences to um, the, the 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 people of South Africa. Um, uh, Nelson Mandela has been a symbol of hope and integrity, a uh, fighter for social justice for so many of us, and uh, it's a it's a great loss uh, to have uh, um, uh, uh, to have suffered for the entire world. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shibusawa, for that kind introduction and for the excellent work of JCIE. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Minister Aso 
Professor Takemi and the government of Japan for hosting us and for the continuing support, strong partnership between Japan and the World Bank Group. from Ethiopia, Ghana, Myanmar, Senegal, and Vietnam who are with us today. Thank you for your time and for your commitment to universal health coverage. It's very appropriate that we are meeting in Japan on the topic of universal health coverage. When it comes to universal health coverage, Japan has led the world by example. Japan achieved universal health coverage, as we've heard, 52 years ago, fully 17 years before the global community gathered in Alma-Ata to declare health for all and development in the spirit of social justice. The Kishi and Ikeda reforms that led to universal coverage promoted social solidarity and helped unleash Japan's rapid economic growth and shared prosperity. Japan is not only a leader in achieving universal health coverage for its own citizens, but it's also a leader in extending this commitment to universal health to poor people around the globe. Through its leadership of G8 summits and its various roles in the global stage, Japan has helped mobilize substantial development assistance and has saved countless lives and advanced the health and well-being of millions. Today, there's a large and growing movement in developing countries to undertake the necessary comprehensive health reforms to achieve universal health coverage. To reflect this reality, the goal of universal health coverage should be firmly embedded in the emerging post-2015 global development agenda. The quest for universal coverage is not only a demand for better health, it's a demand for equity. At the World Bank Group, achieving universal health coverage and equity in health are central to reaching the global goals to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity. My colleagues and I at the World Bank are deeply committed to helping countries realize their aspirations for universal coverage. Our aims are clear. First, everyone should have access to affordable, quality health services. Our commitment is universal, but the next 755 days until the MDG deadline in December 2015, we're putting a special focus on expanding access to vital services for poor women and children. We're helping the poorest countries scale up results-based financing programs that are already producing dramatic improvements in maternal and child health in countries from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. Second, no one should be forced into poverty or be kept in poverty to pay for the health care that they need. Every year, an estimated 100 million people, that's more than a quarter of a million people every day, face poverty as a result of out-of-pocket health care costs. So we must pay special attention to affordability for the poorest 40% poorest of the population in every country. Third, all countries must harness investments in other sectors beyond health that provide essential foundations for a healthy society. Achieving universal health coverage requires solutions beyond the health sector, including targeted efforts in such areas as education, social protection, roads, transport, water, and sanitation, public finance, and information technology. For example, we know that one of the most successful interventions to improve child health has involved putting money in the hands of mother, poor mothers via conditional cash transfers. Air quality improvements, as well as tobacco taxation and road safety policies, can play a critical role in turning the tide on the alarming increase in chronic conditions and injuries we see today in so many developing countries. Helping countries advance universal health coverage is a strategic priority across the World Bank Group. Through our bank loans and technical assistance, we're partnering with middle-income countries to design and implement tough health sector reforms and contain costs, while at the same time expanding and sustaining coverage. Through IDA, our fund for the poorest, we're supporting the next generation of countries to lay the foundations for universal health coverage. Japan's continuing strong support for IDA in our current replenishment round is, will be critical if we're to scale up our efforts over the next three years. And through the International Finance Corporation, our private sector arm, we're helping both middle and low income countries harness the resources and innovation of the private sector, working in concert with the public sector. The private sector represents a large and in many cases growing share of the healthcare market in developing countries. So the private sector must be integrated into universal health coverage reform efforts. While there's no single pathway for countries to achieve universal health coverage, 
all countries can learn from one another's experiences as they chart and calibrate their own paths. Why, for example, are some countries able to achieve better maternal and child health outcomes than others with the same level of resources? How have some countries managed a rapid expansion in coverage? What are the best ways for governments to engage private sector partners while ensuring equity and quality? As a global health community, we need to document, evaluate, and share lessons across countries to save lives, reduce spiraling health care costs, and d demonstrate value for money. That's why at the World Bank Group, we're placing a priority in what we're calling the science of delivery. We're gathering data and evidence on what works and what doesn't. We're beginning to, to, to systematically capture this knowledge, and then we'll make sure that these lessons from experiences around the world can be applied to local situations. This is where our Japan World Bank Group partnership on universal health coverage and this conference play such an important role, yielding a wealth of practical lessons from country experiences. Today, I'm pleased to announce that uh, with our Japanese partners, we're releasing a synthesis of case studies from 11 countries that have achieved or are committed to achieving universal health coverage. These 11 countries are diverse geographically, culturally, and economically. But all these countries are demonstrating how these programs can improve health and welfare of their citizens and promote inclusive and sustainable economic growth. The good news is that many low and middle income countries are introducing fundamental reforms and achieving remarkable progress. So what are the main lessons from these uh, uh, 11 countries? Here are just five. First, one, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, strong national and local political leadership and long-term commitment are required to achieve and sustain universal health coverage. Two, short-term wins are critical to secure public support uh, for reforms, as in the case of Turkey, where hospitals were outlawed from retaining patients unable to pay for care. Three, economic growth by itself is insufficient to ensure equitable coverage. So countries must enact policies that redistribute resources and reduce disparities in access to affordable quality care. Four, strengthening the quality and availability of health services depends not only on highly skilled professionals, but also on community and mid-level workers who constitute the backbone of primary care. And finally, countries need to invest in a robust and resilient primary care system to improve access and manage health care costs. Not surprisingly, all of these cases also demonstrate that as countries move toward universal coverage, they will confront competing demands and continuing trade-offs. Countries face choices that can either enhance or erode coverage. The countries which have been most successful in expanding coverage have been in a mode of continuous learning from what's happening both inside and outside their borders and, and adapting their approaches based on the best available knowledge and evidence. A promising message from these case studies is that even low-income countries with low levels of health coverage can still aim for UHC. Countries can start by building their institutional capacity, learning from the experiences of other countries, and adapting innovative approaches that can catalyze the expansion of coverage. These are cross-cutting lessons. Now let's take a closer look at a few of these countries. In Turkey, an economic crisis in the early 2000s prompted major government reforms and laid the groundwork for the 2003 Turkey Health Transformation Program. Turkey cleaned up government deficits, created leaner and more efficient state bureaucracies, and also opened doors for reform in the health sector by breaking old interest group politics. Outcomes are impressive. Today, more than 95% of the Turkish population is covered by formal health insurance. The program now provides a high level of financial protection and equity while ensuring high and rising levels of patient satisfaction. Further, infant mortality rates have declined from 28.5 per 1,000 live births in 2003 to 10.1 per 1,000 live births in 2010. Maternal mortality fell from 61 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2000 to 16.4 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2010. Turkey's example proves that financial constraints, even a major financial crisis, can catalyze the expansion of coverage. The bank group has, is, has been pleased to partner with the Turkish government to support this effort. Thailand, again, and as the, as the Thai officials constantly point out to me, Thailand, against the advice of the World Bank Group, <coughs> uh, 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 ran, uh, revolutionized its workforce and uh, worked, working with a Thai network of rural doctors, led for reforms. 
In addition to increasing the number of doctors and nurses, the government raised basic salaries and, <coughs> excuse me, and um, as a result of the health workforce scale up and other factors, popular utilization of essential health services has improved. Since the universal coverage scheme was introduced there, has been th there, there's been a declining trend in the incidence of catastrophic health expenditures defined as out-of-pocket payments for health care exceeding 10% of total household consumption expenditure. The incidence dropped from 6.8% in 1996 to 2.8% uh, in 2008 among the poorest people in the program. The impact on province-specific incidence of impoverishment has been even more impressive. In the poorest rural northeast region of Thailand, the number of impoverished households dropped from 3.4% in 1996 to less than 1.3% from 2006 to 2009. Each Ethiopia is another country that launched its health extension program in 2003 to promote universal coverage of primary care. The program delivers 16 clearly defined packages of health services for free. At the center of the program is a network of health extension workers, all women, health, uh, all women who are 10th grade high school graduates and are recruited from their communities, trained for one year, and redeployed back into their communities. More than 35,000 health extension workers have been trained and deployed thus far, and their services are now in high demand from other sectors as well, such as adult literacy uh, or sharing of sustainable agricultural techniques. The challenge for them is to continue to enhance the skills and performance of these frontline workers and protect their time to ensure that they can provide communities with the quality health services they need. The latest uh, Ethiopia demographic and health survey data showed that between 2005 and 2010, child mortality fell from 123 per thousand to 88 per thousand, a 28 percent decline. Over the same period, Ethiopia also reports impressive reductions in both stunting and anemia among children, and anemia, excuse me, stunting among children and anemia among women. Contraceptive use nearly doubled, contributing to a total reduction in total fertility rate. And in Peru, the government is leveraging its sovereign wealth funds to jumpstart ambitious reforms aimed at revitalizing, uh, re, excuse me, realizing UHC. The bank group is partnering with the Ministry of Health in Peru to develop a national set of indicators that will allow them to measure, monitor, and evaluate the expansion of coverage and take into account the epidemiological transition that the country is facing. These examples show that all countries face challenges uh, implementing complex health systems reform to achieve UHC. That's why we need global mechanisms through which countries can gain access to the latest experiential knowledge of what works and what doesn't and why. We need to understand why successful examples can be taken from abroad and implemented locally. This points to the importance of having a joint learning platform and network in which policymakers, practitioners, and development partners can engage on the practical how-to issues of universal coverage reforms and put knowledge into, into practice with hands-on problem solving. The World Bank Group is moving toward a global practice as a platform for supporting countries in achieving this, these goals. This also underscores the vital importance of measurement. Although priorities, strategies, and implementation plans will differ from one country to another, all countries need to make their universal health coverage policies and programs accountable and measurable so they can track progress and adjust as they go. But in order for countries to continue learning from one another and to benchmark progress, the world needs a measurement framework that can provide a common and comparable set of metrics. That's why at this conference, the World Bank and WHO are releasing a joint framework for monitoring progress toward universal health coverage with two targets, one for financial protection and one for service delivery. For financial protection, the proposed target is, is that by 2020, we will reduce by half the number of people who are impoverished due to out-of-pocket health care expenses. By 2030, no one should fall into poverty because of out-of-pocket uh, out health care expenses. This will be no small feat. This would mean moving 100 million people impoverished every year now to 50 million people by 2020 and then to zero by 2030. For service delivery, the proposed target is equally ambitious. Today, just 40% of the poor in developing countries have access to basic health services, such as delivering babies in a safe environment and vaccinating children. We propose that by 2030, we double that proportion to 80% coverage. In addition, by 2030, 
80% of the poor will also have access to many other essential health services, such as treatment for high blood pressure, diabetes, mental health, and injuries. In the next three months, WHO and the World Bank will consult with partners to work out the details of tracking these targets. Yes, these targets are very bold, but we need bold targets to close the gap on universal coverage. Simply put, simply put targets drive action. Without the ambitious uh, three by five target for HIV, I wonder whether we would have been successful at getting 10 million people today and counting on antiretroviral treatment. So as we consult, let's commit to move this forward. Let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Countries' futures and many people's lives are at stake. In closing, I want to again recognize our hosts, the government and the people of Japan for their continuing commitment to UHC. We must do whatever we can so that every country in the world can benefit from the experience of Japan. Some 30 developing countries are implementing programs to achieve UHC, and many more are considering to do so. And I at the World Bank stand ready to help developing countries advance on the path to universal health coverage. And while this will not be easy, the lessons and experiences we are sharing today show that it is possible for all countries to realize this goal. It's been 20 years since the landmark 1993 World Development Report, which led to a generation of investments that produced dramatic achievements in global health. It's time to finish the job in this generation. Let's all leave Tokyo with a renewed commitment to ensure that everyone in the world will have access to affordable, quality care so that they may lead, they may lead healthy, productive lives of dignity, equity, and opportunities. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Um, thank you. Um, thanks to the words of encouragement from Dr. Kim, uh, Minister Aso, Dr. Chan, Dr. Evans, and Professor Takemi, um, I think it will prove to be a very uh, thought-provoking, fruitful day, so I look forward to the entire day going forward. Um, I'd like to close this session opening and pass on the next session to Dr. Michael Reich of the Harvard uh, School of Public Health. So thank you very much for the session. Thank you. Very much.